Good morning, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda today. We are having a public hearing on a petition submitted asking the Commission to act on a class of flame retardants known as organohalogens. I'm going to start with a series of three apologies. First, our regular hearing room is under renovation. This is not a regular hearing room, if anyone thought it was. So uh, we're making the best of it, and we are appreciative of everyone accommodating as best as they can the differences of how we have to do things today, both in this room and getting back and forth from this room. And as the logistical questions arise, if you have any questions, Patricia Atkins, I believe, is she's in the back of the room. If you turn around, she's going to pick up her hand. That's Patricia, if you have any logistical questions. Second apology is that everybody's testimony matters, whether they're in person or on the phone, and we have an incredibly tight schedule. And so we're going to be pretty vigilant about the time, and we're going to ask folks, one, we're going to apologize up front about having to cut people off if they go over their time, and we're going to hold ourselves accountable to that same time. But it's really important. When we've had these in the past, we know it can be frustrating for people whose testimony is toward the end People have flights and other arrangements that they're trying to make, and we want to sk stick to that schedule because it matters whether they're going early, middle, or end. The third apology is that uh, at some point today, I'm going to have to turn this over to uh, Vice Chairman Adler to my left. Unfortunately, I had a knee issue arise that requires more medical attention later today, and so I can't be here for the whole hearing. I will watch online as much as I can when I'm not in the room and I'll certainly make sure to watch the recorded version. This is a really important issue for all of us. I've spent a lot of time since I've been in this position trying to attempt to begin to crack the nut of chemical exposure to children. It's a frustrating, and I'm not speaking for my colleagues, they'll speak for themselves quite eloquently. As a parent in particular, it's a very frustrating public policy posture for me that we have to wait to find out that our children might have been exposed to a very harmful chemical and those changes might be irreparable for us to act, us meaning the U.S. government or even industry to act to try to take that chemical out of play. And then even when the way the process works is even when that chemical is taken out of play, we often don't know what's coming in behind it. The term regrettable substitution will come up often today, I'm sure. I think there's a better public policy route to be taking so that we are figuring out alternatives that actually work and not continuing to whack-a-mole, get rid of a chemical that doesn't work, and wait to see in 20 years whether the next generation of children has been exposed. And it's not only flame retardants. There's many other chemicals, many other products, areas beyond our jurisdiction of routes of exposure. We're not only talking about CPSC-related items, but there, got, there has to be a better way. And for me, sitting in this seat as a public policymaker, all I want to know is, does the action that we take make a difference for safety for children? If, and for those who I will be asking questions of, if we take the action requested or take a different action requested or don't take this action, how will we, the five of us, know that the choices we make will definitively make consumers, especially children, safer. That is my primary motivation. We want to make sure that whatever we do is actually going to help. And this, unlike taking out something like lead in children's products, this is a much more complicated public policy area because there are two potential hazards at play. There's the acute fire hazard, which obviously needs to be addressed, whether that's through some type of chemical or not. I'll leave that up to others to decide. But the fire hazard is real. We recognize that but then so is the potential chronic hazard of exposure. And so whatever we do, we have to make sure that we're not potentially exposing people to more fires if we are gonna act on chemicals, and conversely, that we're not choosing to deal with just the fire hazard without dealing with the chemical exposure hazard. So thank you for everybody for coming today and who will appear online, or I'm sorry, who appear on the phone. We probably, as I mentioned, will not be able to get to everyone's questions. I'd like to leave it up to the Commission to decide how long to leave the record open afterward and to figure out some mechanism by which we can... Between guests and three participants at this time. Okay. There's fewer than three people on the phone right now. Do I need to press this?
Sorry. I have to press star one. Okay, we're hoping that worked. So we will try to figure out some mechanism to have questions for the record to make it as easy as possible for the commission to ask follow-up questions and to have those entered into the record after the hearing is over and be included in any rulemaking that may occur. So with that, we're gonna to turn to our first panel. We are quite honored to have with us Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who is the director of the National Institutes for Environmental Health Sciences, as part of the National Institutes of Health. And unlike me, being in this position, not only is Dr. Birnbaum the head of the agency, she's also an expert. She has spent decades studying these chemicals, flame retardants in particular, and so we are quite, it's quite a privilege for us to have her testifying. And so with that, Dr. Birnbaum, if you can please begin your testimony. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Linda Birnbaum, the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, one of the 27 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health, and I'm also director of the National Toxicology Program, which involves FDA, CDC, and NIH. I'm also a principal investigator of the National Cancer Institute Intramural Research Program. For the last 14 years or more, my research has focused on understanding the environmental health effects of flame retardants, and I am considered a subject matter expert in this area. I would like to just say that I am accompanied by Dr. Chris Weiss, who is my chief toxicologist in my Bethesda office, and also an expert in flame retardants. I'm on honored to be invited to testify today's hearing by the Consumer Product Safety Commission Chairman, Elliot Kay. Synthetic polymers, things like plastics and foams, are generally considered to be more flammable than natural substances, things like cellulose. Consequently, flame retardants have been added to many modern consumer products and building materials for the purpose of reducing the risk and hazard of fire. Flame retardants containing bromine and or chlorine have often been preferred for specific applications due to their efficiency and thermal stability. Halogens, particularly bromine, interfere with fire chemistry by forming radical species that compete with propagation of the combustion cycle. As a consequence of use, many halogenated flame retardants are now found in the environment and have been detected in wildlife and humans. They have the ability to accumulate in biological fluids and tissues, and toxicological and epidemiological evaluations indicate that they are human toxicants. Included among the flame retardants that may be human toxicants are the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs. As a flame retardant, PBDEs are mixed into products without being chemically bonded or reacted to the matrix of the products. Such additive flame retardants have much greater potential to leach into the environment than reactive flame retardants. Once in the environment, they are more likely to present exposure concerns for humans and wildlife. PBDEs are present in household and office dust, are absorbed following exposure, and accumulate in human fluids and tissues. Toxicity in rodent models include effects on endocrine disruption, such as thyroid hor hormone homeostasis, modulation of estrogen and androgen signaling, effects on obesity and diabetes, altered fertility, and neurotoxicity. Epidemiology studies have documented many of these same effects in humans. Fetuses, nursing infants, and young children may be at highest risk due to critical developmental windows of susceptibility and or the potential for greater exposures. Now, there are 209 possible congeners of PBDEs, and three different molecular weight formulations have been used as commercial flame retardant products. Two of the commercial mixtures have been shown to be carcinogen carcinogenic in both rats and mice. The extent of absorption, the internal dose, and the toxicity are largely determined by congener differences in bromine number and substitution patterns. Congeners of the lowest molecular weight mixture used largely in polyurethane foam are readily absorbed and are prevalent in human tissue and fluids. The major congener of the highest molecular weight mixture 
used primarily in heavy textiles and heavy plastic casings for electronic equipment, is poorly absorbed but persists in the environment. Concern over persistence and toxicity has led to removal of all PBDE commercial formulations from production in the U.S. and bans in Canada, Europe, and Japan. The lower molecular weight PBDEs have been listed for elimination under the Stockholm Convention of Persistent Organic Pollutants, and DECA BDE is currently proposed for listing as well. Another high-volume brominated flame retardant also listed for elimination under this international treaty is hexabromocyclododecane, or HBCD. HBCD is also a persistent and additive flame retardant and is found in the environment, in wildlife, and in people. Mechanistic and animal studies have indicated it is an endocrine disruptor, it is toxic to the liver, and causes adverse neurodevelopmental effects. Tetrabromobisphenol A, or TBBPA, is an example of a halogenated flame retardant with a biological fate that is different from that of HBCD and PBDEs. TBBPA is a reactive, high production volume chemical bonded to resins of circuit boards. An advantage of this reactive application is that there is low potential for TBBPA to leach into the environment. Although readily absorbed following exposure, TBBPA is rapidly conjugated and excreted, resulting in low bioavailability and little potential to accumulate in tissues. However, recently, the use of TBBPA in an additive mode has increased. Current research is assessing where there may be adverse effects due to greater levels of exposure for both humans and wildlife, continuous exposures, and epidemiological studies detecting TBBPA in human serum and breast milk in the United States, Europe, and Asia have been conducted. Dr. Birnbaum, I'm just going to let you know that we've moved into my time for questioning, but I'm going to yield that time for you to please continue testifying. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, okay. So thus far, animal studies have shown it to be a carcinogen in rats and mice and to cause endocrine disruption. Studies are underway to assess the potential for TBBPA to cause developmental effects in rats at low doses. This work will lead to a better understanding of the health risks of TBBPA to humans. Some brominated and chlorinated organophosphate flame retardants have been known for over 30 years to be animal carcinogens. Recent studies have shown that some of these are also developmental neurotoxicants. Alternate halogenated flame retardants include a TBBA derivative TBBPA, DBPE, a tetrabromobenzoate, TBB, a tetrabromophthalate, TBPH, and decabromodiphenylethane, or DBDPE. TBB and TBPH are often used in a commercial mixture, Firemaster 550, which is used as an additive flame retardant. A small study in animals has demonstrated endocrine disruption and neurobehavioral impacts of developmental exposure to Firemaster 550. Both TBB and TBPH have been found in house dust, and a metabolite of TBB has been found in human urine. TBBPA, DBPE, TBPH, and DBDPE, which are environmentally persistent and found in wildlife, are poorly absorbed and persistent, whereas TBB is well absorbed, rapidly metabolized, and eliminated. Toxicological studies are underway to characterize the risk of exposure for these and other novel halogenated flame retardants. In conclusion, the halogenated flame retardants for which there is data have been shown to be environmentally and or biologically persistent and toxic in animals. Many have also been shown to have impacts on human populations. When used in an additive mode over time, they leach into the environment and they have been detected in people. Use in a reactive mode or in polymers reduces the opportunity for exposure and hence reduces risk. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Birnbaum. I'm reclaiming my time. And Mr. Stevenson, how much time? I have three minutes. Great. Thank you. I'll try to be very quick. So I'm going to ask two questions, and I'm going to ask them together so that you can at least have the benefit of knowing what they are, and then you can answer them with the remaining time, please. The first one is the high-throughput screening that 
you all are doing as part of Tox 21, does, has that included the organohalogen flame retardants? Yes, some of the some of the um, Tox 21 efforts have looked at a number of the um, PBDEs of TBBPA of HBCD and some of the others as well. In addition, some of the halogenated organophosphates have also been looked at in the rapid high throughput screening. And what has that shown so they far? They have shown that they have high levels of biological activity. And is that data publicly available? That data is available. Okay, thank you. And the second question is to my earlier public policy point. If the commission goes ahead and acts as the petitioner's request or acts in some way, how will we know that we're actually making people safer? I think one of the questions that always needs to be asked when you use chemicals is do we need them? Are they really providing a safety benefit? And I think that's a question that needs to be asked specifically with the use of many of these flame retardants. The data is not strong, which indicate that they actually provide fire safety at the concentrations with which they have been used in the products. So I think that removing um, some of the chemicals from use, which has already been done with the PBDEs, although we have a tremendous legacy, um, people would talk about toxic couches and carpet padding and so on, and what do we do with that? But removing other chemicals, unless we really have strong evidence that they provide fire safety, there really may not be a need for them. Great. Thank you very much. With my time expiring, Commissioner Adler. Thank you very much and welcome, uh, Dr. Birnbaum. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you at the uh, Commission's hearing. Um, in your testimony, you walked through individual organohalogen chemical by individual organohalogen uh, chemical, and we have been uh, advised by some industry folks that we should proceed chemical by chemical in addressing organohalogens. Uh, the petition asks us to do something in the alternative, which is to look at organohalogens that are non-polymeric additives as flame retardants as a class. Uh, do you have any observation one way or the other about how we should proceed, assuming we were to proceed? So uh, you're the head of a sister agency, and you're also the director of the National Toxicology Program. You get to look at thousands and thousands of chemicals, or at least you have the potential to look at them. We have arguably thousands of chemicals under our jurisdiction, and so as a tiny agency, we have to prioritize. And so I guess my question would be, of the thousands of chemicals out there, uh, would you consider these organohalogens to be something that should be worthy of a tiny agency with scarce resources addressing as a priority concern? Yes. Uh, no further questions at this moment. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you so much, Dr. Birnbaum, for coming today, and Dr. Weiss for accompanying Dr. Birnbaum. Um, I am going to follow up on Commissioner Adler's question, um, and I'm going to do it the same way he did since we only have five minutes, and that is ask you three questions, and then you figure out how to sort it out. Um, but in terms of grouping, because we're being asked not only to ban a group, but going forward to ban things that haven't even been created that would fall into this um, the, this class of product. And so my first question is, I know that, I, I, that a lot of institutions have accepted the fact that grouping is appropriate for regulatory purposes as long as you have the structural similarities that are needed. But my understanding is that if there are structural, slim, simil, if there are structural differences within a, a grouping, that would result in a different endpoint, that that's something that we need to do, know about. So I'm interested in your comments as to whether you would expect there to be any structural differences in chemicals that fall within this non-polymeric additive 
um, organohalogen um, flame retardants group that would perhaps have a different endpoint. And I was particularly interested in the written testimony that you submitted because you said that TBB, to quote you, is well absorbed, rapidly metabolized, and eliminated. So it seems to be different than some of the other um, chemicals in that group. So I'm just interested in your comments on that. So structural differences can be associated with some different health or environmental impacts. However, that doesn't mean they don't have impacts or effects. The flame retardants as, as a class are impacting many, many, thank you, many, many um, different health systems and health impacts. And I think our greatest concern today, more so even than the cancer, which has been shown for the flame retardants that have been tested, both some of the halogenated organophosphates, which are very structurally different than, for example, the PBDEs, but they've all been shown to be carcinogenic in animal studies. But I think a lot of our concern is for the developmental impacts. And what we are finding is that whether they're some of the halogenated organophosphates, whether they're the rapidly eliminated or the persistent halogenated organics um, compounds, what we are finding is that they cause a spectrum of adverse developmental effects affecting the developing uh, neurological system, affecting the endocrine system, affecting the reproductive system, and are associated with persistent long-term effects in the next generation. And so in your opinion, as one of the experts in the flame retardant field, would it be appropriate to group this group of uh, non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants into one group in terms of this commission making a determination about a ban? I think it is appropriate. Okay. You, um, you've been quoted as saying that, you, that when you first looked at this petition that there was no way, you thought there was no way of condemning an entire class of chemicals. But then you said that after taking a closer look at the science that you thought the petitioners were onto something, to use your words. Could you just explain that to us? I think it's not only taking a closer look at the science. I think it's really taking a closer look at what the petition is proposing, which is not to ban all halogenated flying retardants. It's to ban them in specific classes of products, and it's also to ban those that are additive, not to ban those that are in polymeric form. And the advantage of the polymeric compounds is that they have much less um, potential to escape into the environment and therefore to expose wildlife and people. We know that for all the compounds that are used in an additive mode, they do get to us. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Thank you for Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, let me begin by saying thank you to Dr. Birnbaum and Dr. Weiss for being here this morning and providing your expert testimony. We really do appreciate it. I just want to follow up on my two colleagues, Commissioner Adler and Commissioner Robinson's questions. So Commissioner Adler asked about whether or not it would make sense to prioritize among all of the chemicals. I, I think I have that right. But specifically, in this group of chemicals that we're being asked to consider now a ban on, because <laughs> to your words, the reality of what of our resources are limited, and it's very expensive and it takes a lot of time. So if we had to prioritize within this group of chemicals that we're being asked to ban, could you suggest an order for us? Uh, Commissioner, that's a very difficult question because some of the different types of organohalogen flame retardants do very different things, and I don't think that I am the appropriate person to say whether I would weigh cancer or developmental neurological effects one over the other. We know that the organophosphate, um, which have been shown to be carcinogens, are also now being shown to be developmental neurotoxicants. We know that some of the um, halogenated, the persistent chemicals are shown not only to be carcinogens, but are shown to be, be associated with the increase in diabetes and obesity in offspring, and we're shown that they're developmental neurotoxicants. So I think that I would have difficulty saying which of these are, which of the very large members of the existing class or the potentially to be synthesized class are worse than the others, but I would suggest that essentially all of them will have the potential to cause adverse effects, some kind of adverse effects. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. Mr. 
Thank you, Commissioner Burko. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're moving along very quickly. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to attempt to answer a question that you posed, if you don't mind, uh, although I recognize it wasn't to me. You asked the panelists if we did move forward with the rulemaking, how would we really understand if we were successful? And um, I would offer this as a solution uh, by virtue of policy. In our mid-year review, we as a commission unanimously committed to retrospective review in prospective rulemaking. So um, I would have confidence that if we did move forward in a rule, we would embed in there the kind of retrospective review to look back on our activity to determine whether or not we were, in fact, successful. So I just offer that. Um, thank you, Dr. Weiss, Dr. Birnbaum, for participating today. Um, I have two questions uh, I hope I have time to get to. The first, first is on a particular chemical, hexabromocyclodotecane. So you referenced it in your, uh, in your testimony. Chairman, you're impressed that I was able to say that without stumbling? Oh, yeah. Bob, <laughs> yes. Uh, there were two government studies, uh, Dr. Birnbaum and Dr. Weiss, that looked at flame retardants pursuant to a CPSC open rulemaking on upholstered furniture. The first one was an NAS NRC study in 2000. Uh, you're nodding your head. That's, no, that answers my first question. Are you familiar with the study? Um, and you know, so the quote here that after looking at that is, despite a lack of complete database of a complete database, the subcommittee concluded that the following FRs can be used on residential furniture with minimal risk, even under worst case assumption. And hexabromocyclodotecane was listed there. And then in 2001, there was a CPSC study that looked at. Uh, flame, uh, flame retardants for upholstered furniture again, and the quote was that um, of the four, and HBCD was listed, would clearly not be considered hazardous to consumers as defined under the FHSA. So that's a pretty specific look. Um, the questions that I have for both panelists is, did either of you participate in the study, and if so, um, if, we're, if you're recommending us to ban or move on HBCD, how has the science changed to uh, yield a different decision? I'll take that because that study was done um, by someone who worked in my division when I was at US EPA. By okay. Mike Hughes was the prime author on that. Um, and it was done with co collaborators here at CPSC. And what that was done was a study where they looked at the dermal absorption. Um, and I'm trying to remember, this is 15 years ago, whether it was, I know it was in vitro using, um, and also maybe that we did rat studies in vivo. I'm trying okay. to remember exactly. But the point was is that these are very big chemicals that are going to be very poorly absorbed by the skin. And that was the question that was asked. Are they going to be absorbed through the skin? The question was not asked, are they going to escape from the fabrics into the environment and then be able to be absorbed orally or by inhalation? Thank you. And I think that's <coughs> been a tremendous... Um, growth in our understanding about things that exposures are not always what you think they might be. That sitting mm -hmm. on the cushion is not the problem that it's going to come through your clothes, but that in fact by sitting on the cushion you may be expressing it into the dust and from hence it will get into your body by a different route. Thank you very, very much for that explanation. Um, and one other question on another specific chemical you referenced in your testimony on TBBPA. Um, Specifically, a different um, uh, uh, somebody who'll be testifying later today in their testimony suggested that TBBPA wouldn't be uh, under the scope of the petition by virtue of it um, of its inclusion or incorporation used in uh, motherboards or that part of the electronics, um, and therefore it wouldn't be the external casings. However, my question is the following: in terms of the movement of the industry with TBBPA. Could TBBPA be used as an additive, uh, as a substitute for casings, which would therefore put it under scope if its use changes uh, by virtue of the way the petition is written? So my understanding is that TBPA's use has increased in an additive mode since the reduced use and then the ban on, on the DECA BDE, which has been used in heavy plastic casings and especially in heavy fabrics so that the use has increased in an additive mode. Beyond what was stated or what's known right now and its uh, general use in, would it be uh, electronic motherboards or the interior componentry? Correct, that it's use, that there has been a shift for many, many years. TBPPA, which is the largest brominated flame, largest volume brominated flame retardant, was used in a 90, 90 to 10% ratios of reactive to additive, and that additive percentage is increasing, and that is my understanding. So, and the more that it's used in additive, the more opportunity there will be for human exposure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. This will end this round, and I want to thank again Dr. Birnbaum for your testimony, Dr. Weiss for your appearance. I promise the both of you, you should not take us ending now as indicative of a lack of more questions. We could probably spend hours with just the two of you here, and that will probably be the case with all the panels. We're now going to move on to panel two. Thank you again. As you've noticed, uh, Chairman Kay has departed. Uh, the one thing he didn't say was that he sustained the injury during a uh, Thanksgiving Day neighborhood football game and his team won. <laughs> so I said, is that after you left or before you left? But he <laughs> insisted that it was, it was before. He, he was there through the last bitter moments. Uh, again, just begging your indulgence, uh, if you could please stick within the five-minute period. Uh, and the panelists now are Mr. William Wallace from Consumers Union, uh, Eve Gartner from Earth Justice, Dr. Simona Balin, uh, Dr. Eileen Bloom, and Dr. Miriam Diamond, both of whom are on here by the phone. And Mr. Wallace, if you want to uh, begin. Thank you, Commissioner Adler and the entire commission. Um, on behalf of Consumers Union, the public policy and advocacy arm of Consumer Reports, thanks for the opportunity to present to the commission on uh, uh, requesting rulemaking on certain flame retardant chemicals. Consumers Union joined Earth Justice and the Consumer Federation of America, as well as nine other co-petitioners in filing this petition earlier this year. American consumers are widely exposed from products in their homes that could pose uh, to potentially toxic flame retardant chemicals that could pose serious health risks and may not actually provide significantly better fire protection than other available technologies without these chemicals. Current regulation does not adequately address the health hazards of these chemicals, and CPSC has the authority to protect consumers from the potential risk of harm. It is for these reasons that Consumers Union strongly supports the petition before you. While our organization has not conducted independent testing on this issue, we have followed it closely. Consumers rightly expect products in their homes to meet flammability standards, but not at the expense of being exposed to potentially toxic chemicals. CPSC should ban the use of non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants in children's products and other specified product categories under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act and encourage manufacturers to instead use barriers and inherently non-flammable materials. In support of the petition, we plan to submit comments to the docket, which will include the following points. First, the scope of the petition is clear. It covers organohalogen flame retardants in additive form, and only those in additive form, because they are not chemically bound to the products containing them, and thus have a greater potential to migrate out of products, resulting in human exposure. The specific product categories covered by the petition are those for which it demonstrates that the flame retardants have been intentionally added or are often present in a large percentage of the products. Second, consumers can be exposed to these chemicals for migration or disintegration from household products. Numerous studies have shown these chemicals' presence in indoor air and house dust, and it is reasonable to conclude that they can persist in the indoor environment, leading to chronic human exposure from household products. Studies by EPA and Massachusetts have both found that inhalation may account for a significant proportion of exposures. With regard to vulnerable populations, additional studies have found significant exposure of pregnant women to these chemicals, leading to exposure by fetuses and newborn infants, as well as particularly elevated levels of exposure by young children, likely due to their frequent hand-to-mouth behaviors. Third, CPSC has the authority to regulate products containing these chemicals. We agree with the petition that non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants meet the FHSA definition of toxic in that they have the capacity to produce substantial personal injury or illness, and therefore they should be considered and designated as hazardous substances. The petition documents significant research showing that human exposure to organohalogen flame retardants is associated with long-term chronic adverse health problems with reproductive, neurological, and carcinogenic effects. We furthermore agree with the petition in that the covered product categories meet the definition of banned hazardous substances when they contain the chemicals at issue. We feel labeling would be inadequate. Uh, we feel labeling would be inadequate to serve public health and safety, since consumers' knowledge of the hazard is unlikely to enable them to take steps to sufficiently protect themselves. Consumers cannot reasonably be expected to successfully collect, 
and dispose of the ubiquitous dust in their homes that is contaminated with the specified flame retardants that can have long-term adverse effects on their health. Fourth, it is appropriate for the Commission to make this a priority. The hazard from the specified flame retardants meets many, if not all, of the requirements to be a CPSC priority for action. The probability of exposure is high because the products are ones that most people use daily, such as chairs, couches, mattress pads, computers, and other electronics. Children, a vulnerable population, are at particular risk because they tend to spend more time on the floor in proximity to house dust, have frequent hand-to-mouth behaviors, and may be exposed during critical developmental periods. And continued use of these chemicals is likely to lead to future illness and injury. In addition, current regulation is inadequate, leaving consumers at risk. The Toxic Substances Control Act is widely considered not to give EPA the authority it would need to meaningfully protect the public and to allow chemicals on the market that are not established as safe. Moreover, while there are current congressional efforts to fix the law, it is impossible to know if a bill will pass or be effective at protecting public health. Action taken by CPSC to address this petition would not duplicate existing protections for consumers. In conclusion, we urge you to grant the petition and protect consumers from the documented health risks. Thank you for your attention. Impeccable sense of timing, Mr. Wallace. I hope all the other witnesses will be as uh, effective. Uh, Ms. Gardner. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. I am Eve Gardner, a staff attorney at Earth Justice. Along with Consumer Federation of America, I represent the petitioners here. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and I also appreciate the very careful study that the Commission is giving to this matter. As you know, the petition asks for regulations under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act to protect consumers from non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants in additive form in four categories of consumer products. Under the FHS FHSA, uh, the legal standard that, that we're asking you to operate under is that if a substance has the capacity to produce personal injury or illness through ingestion, inhalation, or absorption, then the chemical or the, the, the product is toxic. And if a substance or product is toxic, and in addition, it may cause substantial personal injury or personal illness as a proximate result of customary or reasonably foreseeable use, then it meets the definition of a hazardous substance under the FHSA. And if labeling will not protect against the injury, as it would not here, then the CPSC must ban it. So Dr. Birnbaum uh, referenced PBDEs, a group of organohalogen flame retardants used in added, additive form that would be covered by this petition. The PBDEs are a case study for how federal regulations and policies are not now protecting us from products containing chemicals that are well understood to be toxic. For decades, PBDE flame retardants were used extensively in a wide range of consumer products, and as Dr. Birnbaum explained, they present very serious human health risks. And because they are persistent and bioaccumulative, 97% of people who live in the United States have measurable quantities of PBDEs in their blood. Children have the highest body burdens, and children from communities of color have the very highest levels. So in the face of what was known a decade ago about the toxicity of PBDEs, EPA negotiated a voluntary phase-out of their domestic production. But there are two fundamental ways in which consumers are still unprotected against PBDE exposures. First, although PBDEs are not manufactured in the U.S., they are still being made overseas. Yet no U.S. law or regulation prohibits the importation and sale of products containing any PBDE. Some states have banned the sale of some products containing some PBDEs, but this scattershot approach is not sufficient. EPA has proposed using its significant new use rule authority to prohibit the import of products containing PBDEs, but strong industry pushback has prevented those rules, the SNR rule, from being finalized. So we know from manufacturers self-reporting that children's products containing more than trace amounts of DECA BDE are still being sold in this country. And it's possible that imported furniture containing PENTA-BDE is still being sold as well. We have no way to know for sure either way. The importation of products containing toxic PBDEs is a major regulatory loophole. Granting this petition would fill that hole. 
Second, the voluntary phase out of PBDE production did nothing, uh, as Dr. Birnbaum referenced, did nothing to protect people in the U.S. from the legacy exposures, the toxic furniture and poison to toys that people already own that are still in the homes of millions of people, especially in low-income communities. Um, but again, most people keep their sofas for decades and then pass them on to their kids. So we're passing on you know, assen essentially just toxicity for generations. If CPSC were to declare products containing non-polymeric organohalogens in additive form to be banned hazardous substances, as we've asked for, it would have the authority under Section 15 of the FHSA to protect consumers against the PBDE-laden products in their home. So how do we learn from the past? Obviously, manufacturers have replaced PBDEs with other non non-polymeric halogenated flame retardants, and the mounting evidence is that they are similarly toxic. That's not a huge surprise. It's a basic fact that chemicals with similar structures are similarly toxic. So uh, all additive non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants bear the structural similarity of a common functional group. They have shared physical, chemical, environmental fate, and toxicity properties they are all likely to be toxic within the meaning of the FHSA. They should be regulated as a class. We should not continue to make the mistakes we made with PBDEs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Balin. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Can I see some hands? There you go. Thank you. So I'm uh, Simona Balan, senior scientist at the Green Science Policy Institute and one of the co-petitioners. And I would like to make the point today um, as to why it's important to address the entire class of organohalogen flame retardants, non-polymeric in additive form. And I believe the example of Penta BDE really puts this into perspective. So in order to prevent what the CPSC estimated in 2008 as 30 preventable small open flame furniture fire deaths, Penta BDE was added to furniture and ended up in 97% of the U.S. population, which is over 300 million people. And even though penta -BD was phased out, similar organohalogen flame retardants continue to be used in the four product categories mentioned in the petition. Um, next slide, please. And um, more and more scientific evidence is emerging that these chemicals share properties, um, and in Dr. David Apple's um, Professor Marisa Stanford University's words, um, the properties shared by all organohalogen flame returns as a class can lead to adverse effects for human health. So what exactly are these properties? Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is also from uh, Dr. Appel's research and his collaborators, but um, I would like you to understand that organohalogens are not natural to our biochemistry. Our cells were not developed um, while being exposed to such chemicals, and so they're not designed to address these, um, these chemicals. Our cells are actually pretty good at recognizing certain toxics or removing them from the cell, but organohalogens make it past our defenses, and they can persist for a long time inside the cells, and they're not removed by the cell detoxifiers. And new research by um, uh, Professor Amra Hamdan from the University of um, California at San Diego has actually found that not only do they are they unrecognized by the cellular bouncers, but they can also inhibit the cell's defenses, making them less able to deal with other toxicants. Next slide, please. And we are still catching up with the research on PBDEs. Um, just this year, after the petition was submitted, more papers came up on um, the adverse health effects from PBDEs and uh, understanding the mechanisms through which these adverse health effects are happening. For instance, delayed puberty in girls, increased risk of preterm births, impaired executive function in young children. So these are really um, important adverse health effects that we should consider. Also, another research paper has analyzed 35 brominated flame retardants that are used as PBD replacements and concluded that they have similar enough physical chemical properties in terms of persistence, bioaccumulation potential, potential for low age transport, that in the author's words, they cannot be regarded as suitable replacements to PBDEs. Next slide, please. 
So we are already seeing government agencies addressing the entire class of organohalogen flame retardants. For instance, Biomonitor in California placed the entire class of brominate and chlorinated organic compounds used as flame retardants on their authoritative list. Their scientific guidance panel reviewed this class between 2008 and 2009 and found enough risk of exposure and adverse health effects to warrant including this entire class, um, including chemicals that haven't yet been marketed that are still to, to be developed within this class. Next slide, please. So this quote uh, from Drs. Needleman and Landrigan was written in 1994, but I think it's still incredibly timely that we are conducting a massive clinical toxicological trial, and our children and our children's children are the experimental subjects. So it's clearly time to start ending this experimental trial, and the CPSC does have the authority to help protect consumers from organohalogen flame retardants in these product categories. and we as co-petitioners um, selected these four product categories because we know that these are the ones where consumers are most likely to be exposed um, when the organohalogen flame turns are used in additive form and when they are non-polymeric so they're easily taken up inside the cells. So thank you for your time and for the opportunity to provide comments. And yeah, we're welcome to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have uh, Dr. Arlene Bloom on the telephone and Dr. Miriam Diamond. I'm going to call on Dr. Bloom first. Uh, Dr. Bloom, can you hear us? I have no idea. Uh, Dr. Bloom, can you hear us? Dr. Bloom? Okay, well, let, let's see about oh, that. Hi, they, you just took my mute off. Okay, good. I'm oh. on the phone. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm Arlene Bloom. I'm the executive director of the Green Science Policy Institute, and I'm also a visiting scholar in chemistry at UC Berkeley, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you remote today. And I'm going to speak to you about the topic of regrettable substitution, because that is one of the major reasons that it is imperative to um, consider the whole class of organohalogen flame retardants. And the classic in my slide number two uh, you can see on the left a flame retardant called decabromodiphenyl ether. That means 10 bromines, two phenyl rings, and an ether bond. And, um, and you can see the two rings with the ether bond and bromines all around. And after many years, um, this flame retardant, which has been widely used in uh, fabric back coatings and electronics and a variety of uses, was found to be uh, persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. And again, with an EPA agreement, but not with uh, a regulatory approach, has indeed been phased out. It's not manufactured in the US. But as the sale of the uh, ether went down, the replacement on the right is uh, looks very similar, decabromodiphenylethane, which has a, a, a different connection, the ethane, rather than the ether. But it is, turns out to be possibly more persistent and bioaccumulative, and there's increasing results showing that it's toxic. So this is that regrettable substitution, sometimes called toxic whack-a-mole. And in the next slide, number three, uh, my experience with this goes back a very long time, um, nearly, nearly 40 years, to uh, when in 19. 77, I published a paper uh, about flame retardants in children's pajamas. Uh, at that time, the main flame retardant was a, a chemical called brominated tris. It was up to 10% of the weight of the fabric in most children's pajamas in the U.S. Um, it was found that it ended up inside the children, um, and it was a very strong mutagen. Um, we published this paper, as I said, in 1977 in January. And in the next slide, um, slide four, you can see that uh, three months after we published the paper, uh, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission banned brominated trysts from children's pajamas. So you were able to act quite rapidly in those days. 
but when brominated tris was banned, the unfortunate substitute was chlorinated tris, uh, which had similar properties and was indeed, uh, with the assistance of the CPSC, uh, removed from pajamas in 19 se 1978. Um, and I have to say that since that time, which has been uh, approaching 40 years, uh, I have followed this and have not yet seen a flame retardant, organohalogen flame retardant, that has not, upon study, um, turned out to be problematic. So um, there, there's a long, unfortunate record. And as people have said in the next slide, um, Penta BDE has a wide variety of, of human health effects. Uh, neurological, um, reproductive, and in the next slide, uh, most recently, the National Toxicology Program found clear evidence of uh, cancer-causing activity from PentaBDE. And that means that the PentaBDE couches that are in so many homes, particularly low-income homes, have the potential to cause serious health problems. And since it was used in all furniture pretty much, we, we did a study of 100 couches and found that most furniture from 1975 to 2005 um, in the U.S. contained PentaBDE. So this is a very long-term and serious problem. But in the next slide, when um, PentaBDE was phased out, um, the replacements were chlorinated tris, the same chlorinated tris that had been removed from children's pajamas in the 70s, even though the CPSC had uh, said the estimated lifetime cancer risk was up to 300 cancer cases per million. Uh, there was a CPSC study saying that in 2006. Nonetheless, it was the major replacement. And the other replacement, uh, Firemaster 550, uh, the EPA designed for the environment, predicted reproductive, neurological, and developmental toxicity, as well as persistent degradation products. And indeed, uh, if you note the Chemtura brochure on the left, it uh, claimed that the human health toxicity, whatever that means, a fire master would be half of that, a penta, I, I guess is an advertisement for the change, but is, is that good enough? Um, so we knew that, and yet in uh, 2005, those were the replacements. Uh, Dr. Bloom, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but your time has expired, but I'm going to yield you, if you would like, out of my time, an additional 30 seconds. Okay. Um, sorry, I talked too slowly. Um, and no. I know, okay. oh, now I can't find my slides. Um, okay, well, I think just to conclude that, that we have considerable data that the substitute um, tend to have the same properties, and um, that, indeed, I was going to just conclude with the quote from the Chicago Tribune to remind people um, that a deceptive campaign by industry brought toxic flame retardants into our homes and bodies, and the chemicals don't work as promised. So there is a real opportunity um, to reduce the use of these chemicals for Okay, Doc, Dr. Bloom, I'm going to have to cut you off right there, and I apologize for doing that. We may be able to get back to you during the questioning. Uh, I'd like now to see if we have Dr. Diamond on the phone. Uh, okay, uh, I'm told that it, by our technical expert that it takes a minute to... Uh, get folks off of mute, so I'm just going to keep asking Dr. Diamond if you are there. Dr. Diamond, can you hear us? We'll try one more time, and if not, then I think we can move to uh, questions, and if Dr. Diamond comes online, then we can uh, ask for her testimony one last time. Dr. Diamond, can you hear us? Uh, apparently, she cannot, so uh, I'm going to move to ask a few questions. Um, and I think uh, I, what I'd like to do, uh, Dr. Balin, since you're here and we can see you and you're uh, uh, somebody that uh, I can ask this question of, we have a claim that will be made this afternoon uh, that EPA and other governmental authorities have determined, and this is what the phrase was that got me a little confused, 
that some of the chemistries impacted by the petition do not present a significant risk to human health or the environment. So I guess my question is a broad one. Are you aware of any organohalogen, non-polymeric, flame retardant additive that EPA or any other governmental agency has determined does not present a hazard to the environment or human health? I am not aware of that. Uh, I know the EPA is in the process of reviewing certain uh, groups of organohalogen flame retardants, um, but yeah, no, <laughs> I am not aware. Uh, and uh, Ms. Gardner, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, the petition uh, limited itself to four categories of consumer products, but I sat down and I said, "What other consumer products out there?" And I thought candles, carpets, cabinets sheets, towels, shower curtains, appliances. There are a lot of other uh, products that conceivably might have organohalogens. So one of the things that we have to do in deciding whether to grant the petition is to figure out what the scope of the petition should be. Can you explain in a little bit more detail why you limited the uh, request just to these four product categories? Yes, Commissioner Adler, we, we chose categories where, uh, where we know organo organohalogen flame retardants are used in additive form and in non-polymeric form so that, that it would lead to human exposures. And we also chose categories where there is documented evidence that there really is no fire safety benefit to using the halogens at the levels where they're currently used. So that might also be the case for additional categories of products, but these are the ones where there's, uh, where there's documentation of the lack of fire safety benefit. Um, and uh, if I might, uh, uh, Ms. Gardner, uh, we heard uh, Dr. Bloom's discussion of regrettable substitutions. She did it product by product, showing that when you use one in the famous phrase of whack-a-mole, mm -hmm. you find another one. But can you explain more broadly uh, what the notion of regrettable substitution is and why it's of such concern to the petitioners in this particular case? Yeah, so the, the concern is that um, unless there's a prohibition on the use of any chemical in this class, that if what, what we've seen as um, as Dr. Bloom was saying, PentaBDE was used for decades in sofas. EPA determined uh, 10 years ago that that posed risks. So they were three or four years later than Europe in determining that. Um, but, but they, but they uh, entered into this voluntary phase out. And then uh, new chemicals came on that have similar chemical structures and similar toxicity. And the concern is that if, if this commission were simply to act against particular chemicals, then we would then the next replacements would have the same problem similar toxic similar structure similar toxicity the only way to get at the root of the problem is to address all the chemicals that have this this structure the the bonding of the or or, or the carbon atom and the uh, halogenated chemical thank you very much for the question i have one last question dr balin if i might direct that to you we're going to hear testimony this afternoon from a manufacturer who claims to have developed effective halogen-free reactive FR chemicals for use in some consumer products. Setting aside the question of whether we need FR chemicals in some of these products, is it possible to develop an effective halogen-free reactive FR chemical for use in consumer products? I believe it is, and I, I believe that um, by banning products containing additive non-polymer organohalogen flame retardants, we would be opening uh, further opportunities for innovation, for finding safer, safer alternatives. So the fact that the uh, flame retardant would be reactive, that's a good news because it means it's bound to the material, will be less likely to cause exposure. Even if it shows some toxicity, consumers will not be exposed to it during product use. Thank you so much. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Um, one of my frustrations in reviewing the voluminous materials that, that were submitted and in listening to presentations that have been given to us over the last few weeks is making sure that we're dealing with only what's relevant to you petitioners. And since you're all petitioners, I guess any of you could answer this, but Ms. Gardner, I'm going to aim this question at you. I just want to be perfectly clear that the only thing that's being asked in the petition, as I understand it, deals with non-polymerics, not polymerics, correct? That's correct. Additive, not reactive, that's right? That's correct. 
And when when um, we're talking about electronic devices, what, when you're talking about the products, the others are very clear, but I want to be perfectly clear on this, where you're not talking about any flame retardants inside the electronics, but only the casings, That's correct? That's correct. Okay, and hopefully we'll be able to limit all of the presentations today to just those um, that are within the, the subject areas of the petition. The other thing, um, Dr. Balin, I would like to ask you, because we're being asked not only to ban products that are in, existent, that in existence, that are non-polymeric, additive, organohalogen, flame retardants, but we're also being asked to ban products that might be created in the future that are in this category. And not being a scientist, I need you to tell me whether you can think of any situation in which a chemical, a flame retardant, could be invented that met these criteria that did not have the same end point of toxicity that the, the group that is in existence now apparently has. Yeah, I think, so the, we're, we're taking, you know, a regrettable substitution, you've, you've heard a lot about that, the problem of regrettable substitution, and um, as Dr. Birnbaum said before, um, there are different toxicity endpoints for these organohalogen flame retardants, but they do all have certain things in common, and it's, it's too bad that Dr. Diamond could not speak because she has studied the physical chemical properties of, of um, organohalogen flame retardants and knows that they, they tend to all share uh, the properties of persistence and bioaccumulation. So we will have those chemicals in our bodies, and by the time we get them in our bodies in the environment, it would take a very long time for us to determine if they have um, harmful human health effects. So, And would you expect any of the chemicals within this category to be an SVLC? Yes, that, uh, yes, that is what Dr. Diamond's research has shown. And uh, as I said in my testimony, organohalogen, organohalogens in general will tend to enter our cells and be there for a long time and have potential to cause toxicity. And you're speaking of the lipophilic characteristic. Yes, um, the ones that are um, that have phosphates in them, so the halogen organophosphates, those are not lipophilic, so they don't tend to bioaccumulate as, as much. They're more water soluble, um, but they are also not recognized by our cells' defenses, and they can have similar, um, they can similarly bypass our defenses and get into the cells to cause toxic effects. I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yes, I understand it. We now have Dr. Diamond on the phone. Am I correct in saying that? Dr. Yes. Diamond? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, okay, that was stressful. I kept calling out. <laughs> well, it's stress, stressful for muted. us, too. But anyway, uh, thank you for agreeing to uh, testify, and you may now begin. You will have five minutes. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, appear before you by phone. Uh, my name is Miriam Diamond. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto for the past 25 years, of which 15 uh, of those years I've spent looking at flame retardants, both uh, through measurements and through modeling. I'd like to make three points. The first point is the nature, the physical chemical properties of the compounds, that they're semi-volatile organic compounds, coupled with the fact that they're additive. The fact that they're semi-volatile com organic compounds means that they can exist both in the solid phase, that is, like, as the additive into the polymer, and in the gas phase at the same time. It's inevitable. Because of this volatility, the tendency for the chemical to go into the air, it's inevitable that they, the chemical will escape from the polymer and enter into the air in the indoor environment. Now, from the indoor air, they will then partition into, th into surfaces. So the first point is it's inevitable that these compounds will slowly migrate from the polymer to which they're added into the environment, be it indoors or outdoors. The second point I'd like to make is that the compounds are persistent. Organic compounds break down by the action of sunlight, extreme temperature, and microbes. Now, organohalogens are very persistent, and that's outdoors, where they persist anywhere, depending on the compound, from months to decades. So indoors, where we don't have sunlight, we don't have extreme temperatures, and we don't have as many microbes, they're extremely persistent. There are very few opportunities for loss. 
couple that with the fact that it's inevitable that they will continue to be emitted from the polymer as long as that polymer is in the environment you will continue to have emissions indoors and persistence of the compound. The third point I would like to make is that because of these properties, we're exposed. We're exposed in several ways. We can directly touch the polymer, and because it's not chemically bonded, some small but significant fraction of the chemical will come off on your hands. And we've done testing on that. Secondly, the chemical, because it's semi-volatile, will tend to um, absorb onto surfaces. Now, those surfaces include toys, includes your clothing. Both of those can be mouth. It includes your skin. It includes the floor. It includes dust. We have opportunities through hand-to-mouth contact for direct exposure from, so, for example, we touch the casing of, uh, of our TV or computer, get the flame retardant on our hands through the casing, through the dust on there, transfer it to our mouth. Um, we're, um, so we're exposed in multiple ways. Now, I think I have one more minute, so I just want to make a final point. This is actually the fourth point. One thing we don't tend to think of... You actually have right. two minutes. Oh, am I out of time? No, you have two minutes. Two minutes? Oh, <laughs> I can slow down. I can have a leisurely fourth point. The fourth point is... Now, we don't tend to think of the end of life, and I, I recognize that you're regulating for fire safety in this point, but it behooves us to think of what happens to these products, particularly electronic products. Those, the plastic polymers are uh, a hot commodity. They're purchased after the plastic, uh, the, the electronic products go into the waste stream. So there's, a, there's a, a, a vigorous market for those polymers that contain flame retardant. Some of those polymers happen to come back to us in other products, including kitchen utensils and other kitchen items. For example, I have measured in my own kitchen spoons the presence of PBDEs that, were, that could not have been intentionally added to kitchen spoons. And we've done subsequent testing to find that other um, plastic products such as kitchen spoons have flame retardants in them. So to summarize, it's inevitable that these compounds as a class will migrate out of products and in effect sort of smear the indoor environment um, and all the um, surfaces in the indoor environment with those chemicals. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for taking me off mute and allowing me the opportunity to present. Thank you so much. Uh, I now move to Commissioner uh, uh, Burkle for questions. And I did want to make one note about an exception. Uh, because Commissioner Robinson uh, and I were not able to uh, ask uh, you questions, uh, I'm going to permit her, uh, after we've uh, gone through these questions, another minute for a question. But it, in the moment, uh, Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, um, and thanks to all of our panelists for being here today. Uh, we do appreciate your testimony. I just have a couple of questions, well, one for Mr. Wallace. Mr. Wallace, in your testimony, you suggest that all of the four categories of products that um, are in the included in the petition include large amounts of these organohalogens. Can you just describe for me what you consider a large amount? Is it a certain percentage? What What, what is the number? It's not a certain percentage. It's our assessment based on our, uh, when we assess the petition to see if we would be signing on and supporting it, um, our, 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 our scientists and our office in D.C., we concluded that, uh, that the science was uh, compelling. Okay. Well, and because we have such a limited time, we'll probably follow up with questions, but thank you. Uh, Ms. Gartner, um, I have a couple questions for you. Number one, in, in your testimony, you suggested that um, so if, if a product is declared a banned um, hazardous substance, that then under Section 15, we could take action. And um, I'm just wondering what, you sugge what you're suggesting by that, a recall or what was... In Relating to the, to the legacy uses. Yes. Yeah, I, so I've read that section through a few times, and I mean, obviously, you have more experience with that, and I, I'm not making a particular recommendation at this time, but it could be a recall, it could be a notice, 
Um, it could, it wouldn't have to be a full recall. There could be replacement foam cushions for sofas. So I think there's a variety of, of um, authorities that you have, um, and I haven't, I probably haven't given it as much thought as, as I as I could. But I do know you have the authority to address the legacy uh, exposures from from chemicals that are already in people's homes. Thank you very much. And then a second question is. Uh, currently, the commission is dealing with phthalates. Another, yes. and we've been advised to, and the scientists, we, t as we're going through this analysis, to divide up and make distinctions between groups. And I'd like to ask your opinion: Why isn't that appropriate in this situation? Why are we asking to ban all of these products? Right. So, well, under, um, <coughs> but um, we, can you say more about when you said by groups? Well, some phthalates have been identified as fine, and others right. are banned. And right now, there's a group of them that are there's an interim I ban see. on, right. and those are the ones we're right. looking to. So decide I think about. with the phthalates, you looked at the the chap um, that was convened looked at a particular endpoint, and that endpoint was male reproduction. And and so you the proposed the proposal is to ban the phthalates that act on that particular endpoint. So what we're saying here, what Dr. Birnbaum said and what Dr. Ballin have said is that, that, that the organohalogens as a class, the, the organ organohalogen flame retardants, they operate on multiple endpoints. So we, we're not saying just look at um, the carcinogenic effect or just look at the neurotoxic effect. Many of them are neurotoxic. Many of them are carcinogenic. They're not 100% all carcinogenic carcinogenic. So, but, but all of them, because of this, this bond and other physical chemical properties that I'll leave to the scientists to describe, all of them have toxicity and meet the standard under the FHSA as being a hazardous substance. They don't all operate in exactly the same way, but all of them meet the definition of hazardous substance. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Bloom, for you as well, I have one question. You mentioned um, some of these chemicals being bioaccumulative, and uh, I'm wondering when they're bioaccumulative, does that necessarily mean that there is uh, some risk of exposure with that chemical? Well, it means that they stay in organisms um, for a very long time, and the levels go up as you go up the food chain. So, um, for example, in they. These chemicals um, are often in wastewater, and they wash into the ocean where very small creatures eat them, and then larger creatures eat the small creatures and get a higher level, and then fish get a higher level, and finally you end up with marine mammals who are where they're quite bioaccumulative, and the highest levels in the world, for example, of PBDEs are in marine mammals um, around California where we had um, the most PBDE usage. And they stay, they tend to be lipophilic or fat loving it is the reason. So they just stay in our bodies a very long time. And we and all other organisms um, continue to be exposed to them. Thank you. I, I, again, though, I'm, and we can have a, a future conversation, I'm sure, maybe in a, a QFR, but with regards to even with that kind of accumulation that you've described for us, does that necessarily mean that there uh, are adverse uh, consequences to exposure? but I think my time is up. Thank you all very much. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, petitioners, uh, for making the suggestion to the agency and the depth and the quality of your petition as well as your availability uh, to myself and the Commission to answer questions about uh, your suggestion. I'm interested in the demand drivers for flame retardants and the incorporation of the four product sectors that you've identified and leaving aside the children's products, electronics, and mattresses, and to focus just on upholstered furniture, if we could for a moment. Um, it's generally understood that California Technical Bulletin 117-75, of course, again, before the 2013 revisions, was a significant dr demand driver for the incorporation of significant amount of flame retardants to be able to meet that uh, very difficult standard um, that, was, uh, uh, that was the rule of law in California. Uh, since then, there's been a 2013 ver version, so California Technical, bu Technical Bulletin 117-13, uh, that has made that standard uh, available to be, to be met through the usage of barriers and other technologies that doesn't require uh, the significant incorporation of flame retardants. 
Um, I have one question for each of the petitioners, and for brevity, I would ask you to answer yes, no, or no comment. Uh, would you support the commission adopting Technical Bulletin 117-13 as a national mandatory standard for upholstered furniture? Mr. Wallace? I'll have to get back to you. I guess that would be no comment. No comment. <laughs> yes. Yes. Dr. Bloom? Yes, I would support it. Dr. Diamond? Miriam Diamond, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, in, in, my previous, in the previous panel, we talked about the exposure pathways with the upholstered furniture and the study that was done, and, uh, and I'm now informed that that was uh, limited to dermal exposure. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you have any additional study or information on the exposure pathway that might better inform uh, our staff's analysis to determine a risk assessment, which would be the threshold that we would have to meet in order to, uh, uh, in order to, to ban moving forward. Do you have anything with regards to uh, exposure pathways uh, from, uh, from other means for the four product categories that are identified in the petition? And I would last, uh, any, of the, any of the panelists may, uh, may jump in if they, if they have something. Okay, um, so the, the currently the, the biggest exposure route is through inhalation of contaminated dust. Um, dermal exposure has also recently been shown to be a significant exposure route as well. Um, inhalation is also important, but I think the, the hand-to-mouth contact is in general the biggest source, and including hand-to-mouth from contaminated dust and from product. So there have been studies showing that touching electronics and then bringing the hands to the mouth can, can create exposure. And also when the electronics heat up, the casings release more um, of these film returns in the dust. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, Dr. Bloom or Dr. Diamond? Um, am I off mute? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, there was um, a very large um, EPA study about four or five years ago that found with Penta BDE, I believe 80 percent of the exposure was from dust. And there have been a, a number of studies um, recently, sadly, finding that children's levels of Penta BDE and TRIS are three to five times higher than their parents. Um, which is believed to be due to hand-to-mouth contact, which is also um, further um, showing that dust exposure through hand-to-mouth contact is, is really a large source, it's given how much higher children's exposure is. And, Thank and the very unfortunate fact that it is that high. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. And, you know, we know that uh, dose is facet venenum, right? The dose makes the, makes the poison. Um, is there any, any of those studies included a rate? While it's, I, I recognize and it sounds like the studies have, have uh, proven that that is a pathway, dermal, oral hand-to-mouth, as well as inhalation. Has there been any studies to, uh, to understand the rate with which we might be able to uh, determine a risk assessment outside of just an acknowledgement that it is, insert, it is a, a pathway for exposure? Yes, and I, I would just add, like, it's Miriam Diamond, I'd like to add one other um, exposure pathway, and that's through directly mouthing materials that have mm -hmm. the flame retardant sorbed. For example, um, the flame retardant from, will go from dust and from air t onto the surface of a toy or clothing that can be mouthed, and that could actually be a significant exposure pathway. The US EPA has um, exposure um, uh, pathway level so that the risk assessment can be done. Um, I think what's unclear is that the dust, we, we know that there's exposure through dust, but we also appreciate that dust is probably acting, acting as a proxy for just the levels indoors to which we're um, exposed, depending on the particular activities of the individual. And as Dr. Bloom mentioned, children tend to be in contact with um, dust more often than adults and also tend to mouth products more frequently, leading to those higher exposures. Um, I will now uh, ask uh, Commissioner Robinson if she has any further questions for Dr. Diamond. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Adler. I, I'm only going to follow up on what Dr. Balin said, Dr. Diamond, that you would be the more appropriate witness to ask this of. 
Um, and I, as you know, we're being asked to ban an entire category or group of, of chemicals based on information we have about only a few of them. And we're being asked to ban future products that fall within the category of non-polymeric additive organohalogens. And I, my question of you, given the fact that I'm not a scientist, is can you imagine that a product could be created that would fall into the category of non-polymeric additive organohalogen um, that would not have the same endpoints that these that we've studied do have in terms of the SVOC, the persistence of bioaccumulation, the hydrophobic um, aspect, and the resulting toxicity? And the quick an answer to that is no. And the reason is that the very the properties that are favored for the compound to be a flame retardant are the same properties that lead to persistence, bioaccumulative nature, and potential toxicity. Thank you. Um, at that, uh, we are now going to take a break. Uh, we're actually ahead of time, a uh, miracle of miracles, and uh, we will reconvene at 1045. Thank you all so much. <laughs>